So what they did instead, being highly intelligent individuals, was play a game of sleight of hand and transformed these Marxist presuppositions into postmodernism in the 1970s. And the idea basically was, well, the working class isn't going to rise up and crush the bourgeoisie because, first of all, they're getting rich and that wasn't supposed to happen. And second, well, it sort of seemed to be a catastrophe when that occurred, let's say, in Russia. And so maybe we won't do that anymore because the working class actually isn't buying into this either, which is also a problem. You know, having internalized their own oppression, they wouldn't buy into this, to the global myth of utopia. So maybe it's because they had some sense, it's certainly possible. But anyways, the sleight of hand was, oh, well, fine, we'll just play a different oppressor versus oppressed game and we'll introduce identity politics. It's like, okay, okay, you're not being oppressed because you're a member of the working class, you're being oppressed because you're a woman. Or you're being oppressed because you have an ethnicity that's outside the main paradigm, whatever that might be. Um, or it's because of your, 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 your sexual preference or your sexual identity. Whatever, whatever places you in some manner outside the normative culture. And, you know, the thing is, the postmodernists, you know, you might think, well, your culture is good for something. It gives you a hierarchy of value. It rewards competent people. It gives you a direction so you can climb up, you know, because otherwise everything's leveled to nothing. And then why do anything? They don't care about any of that. They don't believe that there's any such thing as competence. They don't believe that there's any such thing as up. This is all, postmodernism wipes all of that out. And so when the postmodernists analyze a text, all they care about is how it privileges the position of the author and who it impresses. And that's the only thing they regard as real. And they don't believe in grand unifying narratives. They don't believe that there's a Canadian identity. They don't believe that there's an American identity. They don't believe that there's a Western identity. They don't believe that value structures exist. Or if they are, they're irreplaceable with some other value structure. They certainly don't believe that they have any biological grounding, that there's any such thing as a human being. It's all socially constructed, which is really convenient if what you want to do is be the author of an entirely social constructed u utopia that you can run. And then when the Marxists say, well, that wasn't real Marxism, what it really means, and I've thought about this for a long time, it's the most arrogant possible statement anyone could ever make. It means if I would have been in Stalin's position, I would have ushered in the damn utopia instead, that, instead of the genocidal massacres because I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. You don't understand it. You don't understand it. And you're not that good. And if the power was in your hands, assuming you had the competence, which you don't, you wouldn't have done any better. And even if you had, there would have been someone else waiting right behind you to shoot you the first time you actually tried to do anything good. And that's what happened to all the old guard who ran the damn revolution. Stalin rounded them all up and shot them along with their families and millions of other people. So even if you do happen to be that avatar of moral purity that you claim implicitly, the probability that you'd get to act out your goodness in relationship to those possessed by your ideology is zero. So it's... There's